always thought of myself as one of the enlightened ones. I was raised in an enlightened environment with enlightened people. We didn't really care about silly things like race. I mean, so what? What does it matter if you're black or white or Latino or Asian? It doesn't. It didn't matter, at least not to us. We played together, we learned together, we had sleepovers at each other's houses. We dated in the City of Roses. When I moved to Chicago in 1998, the hardest thing to get used to was the segregation. My African-American family stayed mostly on the south side. My white friends from work and graduate school stayed mostly on the north side. I saw fewer interracial couples, and I heard a lot of talk about racial issues. What's wrong with these people, I thought, these unenlightened people? I wasn't raised like this. People from my neighborhood were more open, more progressive, or so I thought. About two years ago, I started working on a book, a collection of personal essays on marriage, motherhood, feminism, and identity. I decided I wanted to write about my experience growing up in the City of Roses and the profound impact it had on my life. It wasn't until I started doing a little research and digging that I realized the people from uh, Pasadena suffered from the same racist history as many other cities. At one time, the schools were separated. Kids didn't play together. But that wasn't the Pasadena I grew up in. So the story I wanted to tell in my book, it changed a little. Instead of beginning with my own experience, I decided to start with this. On September 14, 1970, Governor of California Ronald Reagan said this of forced busing as a way to solve problems in a Southern California school district. This is a clip from CBS News in 1970. The school busing controversy took two forms in California today. The start of a massive busing program in Pasadena and the signing of a state anti-busing law to take effect November 21st. Terry Drinkwater reports. Governor Ronald Reagan set the stage today for another court test in California of busing to achieve school integration. He signed a bill to outlaw busing without the consent of the parents of each student. Judicial rulings intended to force compulsory busing on parents and families against their wishes and without their consent have distressed the vast majority of our citizens who strongly oppose racial discrimination, but who understandably view mandatory busing as a ridiculous waste of time and public money which could seriously undermine all efforts to improve the quality of our public schools. Besides hampering the quality of education, our children need and deserve by siphoning off millions of dollars in school funds which could otherwise be used for books, new classrooms, teachers, and maintenance. Forced busing would also deprive them of the natural environment of the neighborhood school. The very day the governor signed the anti-busing bill into law, the most extensive busing program ever undertaken in a city outside the South began in Pasadena, California. Here the court had ordered integration. 15,000 students were moved by bus. Half of the youngsters who live in the district commuting to school today for the first time. There was some slight confusion, delays, as neither drivers nor youngsters knew quite where they were supposed to go. Most parents seemed to go along with the plan. A few did not. I don't like it, not with the taxes, and we're within walking distance of three schools right here that uh, we have to bus our children. We're strictly against it right now. I am for it. I think it's the answer to Pasadena's problems. The youngsters generally seem to like the new plan. More of them were in schools dominated by their own age group. Kindergarten through third grade in one school, grades four through six in another, and so on. There were no racial incidents, no friction between the youngsters. I was one of those children. Governor Ronald Reagan didn't live in my neighborhood. Governor Ronald Reagan didn't live in any neighborhood. He lived in the fictitious world of the Hollywood screen where Manifest Destiny was glamorized. He lived in a world where white men were heroes and the indigenous people of this land were savages who needed to be herded up and put in their proper place, a reservation. Maybe this is what Governor Ronald Reagan meant or was suggesting that I and others like me stay on our reservations in the natural environments of our neighborhoods. Well, we didn't, Governor Reagan. And for the record, a ghetto is not a natural environment. A ghetto is a place that's carefully crafted and created by those who are unwilling to look a vicious history in the face. 
A ghetto is like that brother with a substance abuse problem and a family of overachievers. That brother who's been in and out of trouble his whole life and can't keep a job. The rest of the family pretends he doesn't exist and hopes that he doesn't show up at inopportune times to embarrass them in front of their overachieving friends. But he does show up, just like the ghetto. It shows up because it, too, is a part of the family, the American family. And we can't close our eyes to it as it festers in its natural environment. The ground on which it was built was polluted, and so, too, will be its harvest. Too bad Governor Reagan didn't understand this. Or maybe he just didn't care. Some of us did care. So we got on that bus, both black and white. I'm a part of that we that got on that bus that drove to the other side of town, the white side of town. But not the initial we. The black and white people in 1970 who put their children on those buses to be schooled in foreign environments were the real heroes. Not heroes because they put their children in harm's way or dangerous or risky situations, but heroes because they dared. They dared to do something that was right. I got on the bus in September of 1980, 10 years after a judicial order forced the Pasadena Unified School District to use busing as a means to integrate public schools. I was not an activist and neither were my parents. I was a beneficiary of this valiant effort by socially conscious people and activists and nervous parents and community members who had the nerve to deal with America's estranged brother. I was in the first grade. I was a bright child. I was reading and writing early, and I loved school. I really did. Something about the classroom has always intrigued me. Maybe that's why I chose teaching as a profession. When I talk to people today about my childhood experiences, they're amazed at how much I remember and how much I loved it. The colors, the bright rooms, the images on the walls, the discovery room, the library with those headsets. I loved library time. I loved the field trips to the symphony, to the opera, to kid space. Of all, though, what I really loved was the learning, the information. School provided a constant flow of new information for me. Not just information about people in textbooks. I learned about real people. Real families, real children who sat next to me and became my friends. I rode the bus 45 minutes to go to school in the white neighborhood. Many of these kids were bused to my neighborhood, the black neighborhood. Now it's predominantly Latino. Some administrator somewhere figured out how many students from each neighborhood was necessary in order to create a fully integrated environment. I love this arrangement. There is no way my group of lifelong friends would have its ethnic makeup if I weren't bust. In my core group of girlfriends that I still connect with, we've been in each other's weddings, we've celebrated childbirth together and vacation together. There's Stacy, a Jewish girl. There's Desta, a Scandinavian girl from Norway. And there's Malin, a Filipino girl. I knew what Ebel skeevers were long before the late night infomercials made the pan popular. It's a Danish stuffed pancake. This was the result of forced busing, the United Nations. Besides being ex exposed to different cultures, I was also exposed to a world where higher education was the norm. It was expected. Desta's father earned his PhD and was the principal of a local school district. Stacy's father was a lawyer and her mother was an author. Malin's parents were hardworking Filipino immigrants and all of her siblings had finished college and she was on the same track. This brings me to my parents, whom I love dearly, and my community. My father retired from the Navy after 21 years of service to our country. My mother dropped out of high school in 10th grade. She spent most of her life in retail and office work. I'm the youngest of five children, and I'm the only one with a college degree. In my community, even in my family, college education, higher education was not expected. It wasn't frowned upon, but it wasn't expected. And I didn't come from a legacy of formally educated people. And I've come to believe from my own experience and having taught in the community colleges for the past 12 years that it's a challenge. It's a real uphill battle to be successful in college without that legacy behind you, without that support, not just from your family, but from your community, from your people. 
My interest in higher education came from my exposure to a different world. We called it the white side of town simply because most of the people weren't black, but there certainly wasn't this monolith of whiteness. There was a great deal of diversity in this non-blackness. I remember going to a birthday party for a little Japanese boy in my class. His mother brought dried seaweed and Japanese candy for all of us to eat. I went to prom my junior year in high school with an Iranian boy whose family was exiled during the revolution in the 1970s. I ate Persian ice cream at his house, rose ice cream. My homecoming date was Latino, Javier Benuelos. He drove a VW Rabbit. I had a crush on an Armenian boy, Sevag Balikian. He played water polo. I love the water polo boys. This other side of town was rich with diversity, but as a kid, all I knew was that it wasn't black, so that was white. The kids on this side of town were expected to go to college. They saw education as a core value, and studying hard and excelling in school was cool. I secretly wanted to be a nerd, but in my community, being smart wasn't cool, and I wanted to be cool, and I wanted to fit in. So I spent much of my childhood trying to navigate both worlds. Rather successfully, I'd say, but for the most part, I kept these two worlds separate. I had my black friends, and then I had my other friends. There was never any real animosity between the two groups, but somehow they just never really came together. I never really came together. I never really came together because people in the world outside of my childhood experience did live in separate neighborhoods. People tended to live in communities with people who looked like them, who thought like them, who talked like them. They still do. I've lived my adult life attempting to emulate my childhood experience, but my efforts never seem to measure up. I consciously place my children in environments that expose them to children of other cultures, other socioeconomic backgrounds, other ethnicities. I scrape up all the extra pennies I have so that my children can learn to ski, go camping, get involved in theater groups, have lots of books on their shelves, learn to play the drums, draw, paint, take ballet, go to the theater, eat sushi, organic chicken, real maple syrup, quinoa, and lamb. At two years old, my daughter loved guacamole and falafels, and she could say guacamole with a Spanish accent. I take them to a Universalist Unitarian church so that they understand religious diversity and respect the ideas of others. We talk about sexual orientation and gender so that they're clear that these are complex issues that cannot fit into the preferred male-female binaries. This is my way of exposing my children to art, to nature, to humanity. My efforts are artificial. I'm clear. And so were those efforts of the administrators in 1970 in the Pasadena Unified School District. But they're necessary. In nature, diversity flourishes. In her essay, Has America a Race Problem, published in 1890, Anna Julia Cooper writes, All through God's universe, we see eternal harmony and symmetry as the unvarying result of the equilibrium of opposing forces. Fair play in an equal fight is the law written in nature's book. Progressive peace in a nation is the result of conflict, and conflict such as is healthy, stimulating, and progressive is produced through the coexistence of radically opposing or racially different elements. I work at providing my children a diverse childhood experience. As a kid, I didn't have to work to open my mind. I was forced to open my mind, and I'm a better person for it. I disagree with the late former president of the United States, Ronald Reagan. If a natural environment is one in which we stay in our own homogenous neighborhoods and hold on to our own narrow-minded thoughts, then this is the one time that we need to subvert nature. There are times when it's in our best interest to just force people to do the right thing, damn it. Thank you.